Now there came a time when the new Pharaoh arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Now thus begins our scripture lesson from the book of Exodus today. Pharaoh was an Egyptian. And even though Joseph had lived a, a long time in Egypt, married an Egyptian woman, and bore Egyptian children, and he was second in power only to the old Pharaoh himself, Joseph was still considered to be a Hebrew. When Joseph lived, the old Pharaoh invited him to bring his father and his mother, his brothers and sisters, and their families to Egypt. And there in Egypt, the Hebrews settled, they prospered, and they multiplied. But when the new Pharaoh came to power, he saw these prosperous, multiplying Hebrew people as a threat to the social, cultural, and economic status of the native Egyptian population. And he did not have a friendly relationship with any one of them. So what did the new Pharaoh do about this? Well, he enslaved the Hebrew people and made them work for him. And, but even in the grip of slavery, the Hebrew people prospered, and they continued to grow in number. So the Pharaoh enslaved them more brutally and ruthlessly than before, and he commanded the Hebrew midwives to kill all the male children that, that they had helped to birth, so to keep down the population, keep down the strength. And when that didn't work, the Pharaoh ordered his own people to kill the male infants. Now then, this is the time when a woman placed her son in a basket and set him afloat on the Nile River. Now, the Pharaoh's daughter found the child and then raised him as her own, and his name was Moses. Now, we all know the rest of the story, but I want to concentrate on today is the racial tensions in the passage. Yes, I said racial tensions. Today, we would see Egyptian and Hebrews to be of different cultures, to be sure, but the same race. In ancient times, however, the Egyptians and the Hebrews would see themselves as different races of humanity. Clashes over race have been with us from before recorded history. People who look different and act different are viewed with at least suspicion and oftentimes with outright hatred and hostility. Modern scientists agree that human beings as well as other creatures of the earth have a built-in mistrust and fear of those who appear different from us. We tend to see people who look different from us as a threat to our resources and our well-being. After all, those people who look different from us are after the same food and other resources that we are. Now, inside us is this mechanism which is saying they might get our food and the other things that we need before we do and then their children is going to survive not ours so we see those different looking people as rivals as competitors for what we want and what we need and not as helpers not as cooperators and since we understand them to be competitors we view those who look different from us as, a, as less than human. Our instinct says to us, well, we know that those who look like us are human beings, but we don't know if those who look different from us are human. They might only appear human. And if they are not really human beings, well, then we don't have to treat them as human beings. People seem to have always desired to have those they define as their people to be superior to other people. We human beings appear to need to have people who are beneath us, uh, inferior to us, so that there is an excuse to use or exploit those that they believe, that we believe, are inferior. We have always wanted to have disposable people who will do the jobs that we deem to be too dangerous or too disgusting for us. And that attitude is why we can have slaves and have excused slavery for thousands of years. But we can only do that if we believe that some people are less than or not even human. That is what racism really comes down to. 
Racism is treating other people as less than human or not even human. Racism denies another person their humanity. Racism says, you who look different from me are not human and therefore you do not deserve to be treated with the same worth and respect as someone who looks like me. Now we all have that innate tendency, but throughout history people have formalized and crystallized and institutionalized that instinctual caution that we have. Then racism and other forms of prejudice become set within the culture. Many, if not most, people are socialized to fear and hate those who look different. And if not outright hatred, then we foster deep suspicion and mistrust. We can document throughout history how racism and other prejudices have played out. In our world today, we see it all over the earth and all over the headlines in our news. War continues between Hamas and Israel, between Arabs and Jews. War, uh, the radical Muslim sect calling itself ISIS, seeks to annihilate and to expunge any who do not believe as they do. They seek to wipe out the Yazidi people, the Kurds, and the Shiite Muslims. In the world today, 63 countries are at war over various issues, but they are all fueled by an us versus them mentality, dehumanizing the other to make it acceptable to hurt and to even kill the other. There's been a lot of talk in recent years about Barack Obama was elected president and that racism was dead in America. The only thing that kept me from bursting out laughing at the suggestion when I heard it was just how wrong and tragically destructive such a claim is. I know that there are news organizations and even a majority of the Supreme Court who say that racism is over, but don't you believe it. Racism is alive and well in the United States. It did not die. It didn't even take a holiday. Now, the shooting of a black youth, Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, by a white police officer has ignited the racial tensions once again in our country. And there was a youth now in uh, New York State who was uh, strangled and he has died as well at the hands of a white officer. So it continues. This is just... You, one in a long line of other shootings of African-American youth by white police and, the secure, and security personnel. These and other like-kind incidents are, are not just in Ferguson. They're, they're in New York City. They're in Los Angeles and Orlando and Memphis and Columbus and all, all the other cities and towns here in America. Blacks and whites were asked if what happened in Ferguson was about race or not. 83% of African Americans said that it was about race, and 35% of whites said it was. You know, that huge difference in perception underscores the great divide in our country between whites and blacks. And many white people will respond to such percentages by complaining, well, why do black people have to make it all about race? Well, the answer to that question is that for blacks, it is all about racial prejudice and hatred. And although most whites and blacks agree that African Americans have better opportunities and a standard of living than 50 years ago, there is still a long way to go for equality. Now consider that African Americans make up 13% of the U.S. population. And they also make up 14% of the monthly drug users. But blacks make up 37% of the people arrested for drug-related offenses in the U.S and blacks comprise 57% of the people in prison for drug-related offenses. Two-thirds of the prisoners with life sentences are non-whites, and, and in the great state of New York, it's 83% with life sentences are non-white. The U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics concluded that an African-American male born in 2001 has a 32% chance of going to jail in his lifetime, uh, while a Latino male has a 17% chance and a white male has 6% chance. Yeah, I, I could go on. I could go on. But that should be enough to tell you that the systematic racism does exist and it is prevalent 
in our society. Um, and if you, you think that uh, there aren't white supremacist groups, well, Michigan has 18 white supremacist groups. And the great liberal state of California has the most of 77. They even outdo Texas with 52. White people, white people who make up the majority of the population do not notice the institutional racial bias because they have benefited from it and most of the people they know and love have benefited from it. If it is what we call white privilege, simply by being white, we have advantages over people with different skin color for job opportunities, social contacts, and freedom to move about. And most people want to keep their advantages, so they ignore or deny that other people don't have the same. But it's still very much true that white people enjoy more freedoms, more opportunities, and more protection than other races. Most of us here don't have to think about how what happened in Ferguson will affect our family and our friends. But if you're black, you certainly do. And think about it. Armed white men can walk through Target with no consequence, but unarmed black teens are frequently shot by white police. A black person in the store is watched ten times more closely than a white person. There is a built-in prejudice that a black person is much more likely to steal than a white person. Now, many whites complain that blacks are always talking about race and why can't we just stop talking about it? It is to white people's advantage not to talk about race. But for blacks, it is a constant reality of their everyday life. Blacks are sick of talking about it too. They don't want to talk about it either. But they would like to stop talking about it, but not until their children have the same freedoms and opportunities and protections that other races enjoy. Whites would do the same if, we were, if the situation was reversed for us. Now, poverty is a big issue for equality. Poverty begats poverty. And as I've said before, African Americans make up 13% of the population. But they make up 27.4% of Americans who are in poverty, compared to 9.9% of whites. And this discrepancy is not because whites are superior in natural ability, it is because whites are superior in opportunity. Now I know quoting a bunch of statistics eventually just makes your head spin. And then we go blank. And there are many more, but let, let me tell you about a conversation that I had with a member of our church some time ago. Now we were discussing the issue of racism and he admitted with great frustration that he knew racism is wrong, he did not want to be a racist, but that, is, that it is just so ingrained in him by what he was taught overtly and unconsciously that prejudice comes to him without even thinking about it. And he catches himself thinking something racist and then hates himself for it. I'll, I'll give you an example. I told him one day that I, I saw a black squirrel in our neighborhood. And he said, oh, he said the first thing that jumped to his mind, there goes the neighborhood. And he said, it, isn't that horrible? Isn't that terrible that that's his first thought? So I asked him, I asked him what he thought was the answer of overcoming racism. And he replied that sadly his generation will have to die off and less prejudiced generations will have to forge ahead. Now I, I hope that we can find a better way than waiting for a generation to die off. But it goes to show that even sincere dedicated people who hate racism still struggle with racism. With racism. What, what can we do? Well, we can be aware of our racist thoughts and consciously try to correct them. We can stop being ignorant about racism and learn how our institutions and systems are racist. And one such example is, is the school-to-prison pipeline. Now, I, I could do more than a whole sermon about that, but that's for another day. We can, we can demonstrate and teach racial equality to our friends and our neighbors. But first and foremost, we must believe that racism is wrong and that we all must work to correct it. And if we don't, then, then all the others doesn't work. So we've got to believe that racism is wrong. And I said before that in the ancient world that Hebrews and Egyptians would have understood themselves to be of different races. 
Now the same is true in Jesus' day between Jews and Romans, Jews and Greeks. Jesus knew about these divisions, but he stepped over them because he knew that all people were God's children and loved by God. He helped the Canaanite woman, the Gennesaret man, the Roman centurion, and others who were not of his race. Jesus did not reject or deny people because they were of a different race or ethnic group, and neither should we. Jesus asked his disciples at Caesarea Philippi, who do you say that I am? We can say, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God who loves all people and shows us how we should treat everyone as a beloved child of God. And if God loves all people, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we treat all people with equal respect and worth, regardless of their race or ethnicity? Amen.